Good government. Two words with 5,000 years of history. Two words that have inspired great minds, great leaders, and great empires to grapple with questions the world's still asking today. What is good government? How is it built? And how is it sustained? Governments today have many important responsibilities. What can governments do to effectively address these responsibilities? We have examined the data to shed new light on these questions. Governance is critical for a nation's success. Good governance helps nations to flourish, helps nations to be prosperous. We recognize that government systems around the world are very diverse and varied. And so in our index, we took care to focus on capabilities that matter to all governments. The Chandler Good Government Index has been more than two years in the making. We've consulted with government practitioners, leaders, index experts, and researchers to get a full and comprehensive understanding of the nature of good government. The Chandler Good Government Index ranks 104 countries from across the world, which account for nearly 90% of the world's population. It is the most comprehensive index measuring government capabilities and outcomes in the world and to review it and distill it down into 34 indicators. And then we've been able to put those into seven distinct pillars. The index has been designed by government practitioners for government practitioners. So it really drills down into what are those core capabilities that governments need. The Chandler Good Government Index focuses on the capabilities that governments need to succeed, rather than the outcomes of good government. We also want to use the index to tell stories, to celebrate the experiences and the achievements of good leaders and nations around the world. The Chandler Good Government Index is now a powerful tool in the hands of government practitioners and leaders. Leaders in government are now empowered because they can use the index as a tool to identify, measure and address the capabilities that matter. The Index offers data-driven, non-partisan insights to help governments benchmark their capabilities and performance. One that can spark honest, practical discussions about ways to improve. One that draws upon more than 50 data points from across more than 100 countries to help shed new light on two words. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural launch of the Chandler Good Government Index. My name is Yvonne Shan and I'll be your host and moderator for today. We're glad that you're able to join us for this special launch event. We know that it might be very early in the morning or rather late at night for some of you. So thank you for making the time to be with us. Now we're very excited to share the results and the interesting insights we've learned from the Chandler Good Government Index or the CGGI with you. We're also looking forward to hearing from our distinguished panel of government practitioners and experts as they share their ideas and thoughts on building capable and trusted governments. Good government matters to all of us. Governments affect the lives of everyone, no matter who or where you are. Important global challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic, financial crises, and climate change are a clear indication that more than ever, governance is the deciding factor in whether nations succeed. The CGGI is designed by the Chandler Institute of Governance, or CIG. CIG is an international non-profit organization located here in Singapore that supports governments around the world in building capabilities, talent, and leadership. Now, before we get into the main event, I would like to do a quick introduction of the features found on this launch site to ensure that your participation in today's event is as seamless as possible. Please feel free to explore the menu bar where you can find more information about CIG's work and the program for this launch event. We welcome all your questions or comments about the index or about CIG through the chat tab to the right of this video or below it 
depending on whether you're using a computer or mobile device. We will also be inviting you to share your views on two short questions through the poll tab, which can be found beside the chat tab. Lastly, we would very much like to know, what does good government mean to you? Please share your thoughts with us on the message wall, which can be accessed by selecting good government from the menu bar to the left or below this video, depending on your login device. And with that done, let's start our event proper. I would now like to invite Mr. Richard Chandler, the founder of the Chandler Institute of Governance, to formally launch the Chandler Good Government Index. Mr. Chandler, please. Greetings. I'm Richard Chandler, founder of the Chandler Institute of Governance. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the Chandler Good Government Index. You might be asking, does the world need another index? So let me take a few minutes to share with you the genesis of the Institute of Governance, what our philosophy is, and what our dreams are for the future. I believe the most important competition in the world today is the governance competition. The reason talent and capital gravitate to good governance and the winners in tomorrow's world are those that can attract talent and capital. The movement of talent and capital is not just a recent phenomenon. It has always been so. If we look back to Renaissance Florence, we see that in the beginning of the second millennium, one family, the Medici, created a system of governance that attracted capital and talent and created the Renaissance, whose influence on art, culture, is still seen around the world today. For centuries, artists, scientists, creative people would move to Florence and become part of a creative tribe. Florence was the winner. As in the Renaissance, so the story is the same today. To share a family story, I grew up in New Zealand. My mother came from Croatia. At the time she left Croatia, it was part of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was a region of Europe that had known wars for millennia. And so when I was growing up, I would hear the stories of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, French empires under Napoleon, Germanic empires, the movement of borders, the rise and fall of nations. And I had an understanding that governance really did the right thing. That the status quo was never permanent and that governance mattered. In the 1970s, when my parents were starting a small business in New Zealand, New Zealand lost its primary export market, which was the United Kingdom. The UK had joined the European common market and New Zealand struggled to find a new business model. Hence, the government became statist. It invested in large scale, think big projects, which indebted the country and took many years to recover from. The following government went to the other extreme. It opened up the country, resulting in a significant boom, but a boom that turned to bust and would take a decade to 15 years to recover from. So in that story, you know, I could see that skill and expertise in governance is not something that's commonplace, but that every government in its own way, and obviously relative to its own history and culture, was searching for the foundations of sustainable prosperity and well-being for their own country. After I left New Zealand, and in, over the last 40 years, I've been investing around the world. In 1991, I invested in Brazil. At that time, Brazil had spent a period in military dictatorship. And there's a dream and a hope as Brazil opened up into free market economies and a democracy, that life would be better. At that time, the inflation rate was 1000%. But as Chile and Mexico before it had adopted orthodox economic policies, 
So was the same hope for Brazil. However, within a year, the president had been impeached on corruption. The stock market fell 60%. Investors fled. There was broken trust. A few years later, I invested in the emerging markets of Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. There was tremendous hope. Czech Republic opened up first, followed by Russia. However, in 1998, Russia was unable to manage its public finances. It defaulted on its domestic debt. Within 12 months, the currency had fallen 60%. And within 18 months, the stock market had fallen 95% in dollar terms. Russia had broken trust with the investors that supported the economy. It would take a long time to recover. A few years later, I invested in South Korea. We were involved in a large corporate governance battle. As the largest shareholder in one of Korea's largest chai bowls or business groups, we witnessed a $1 billion accounting fraud. The chairman went to jail, but a little, light, a little time later, he came back to run the company. From these experiences, we see that prosperity is sometimes not permanent, that governments face challenges, that the path forward is uncertain. And so we ask ourselves, where is the discipline of governance in the world? What do we really know about governance as a discipline? As I witnessed vibrant marketplaces creating prosperity, in many countries, it was not so. What we did was to start wide-scale philanthropy. We established a, an organization in Philadelphia with 100 researchers supporting small grassroots NGOs in developing countries around the world. After about a decade, we realized that this approach was not scalable and it was not resulting in structural change. In 2008, I therefore decided to focus on the foundations of prosperous economies, education and healthcare. We set up small education and healthcare and vocational training businesses in seven large developing economies across Asia and Africa. After several years, we ran into all of the problems that small businesses face. Excessive regulation, corruption, and therefore we encountered the reasons that prosperity had not been able to grow and take root. And most of it had to do with a poor regulation or excessive re regulation. And we came to understand that prosperity was not possible unless we had three elements of society working together, government, the marketplace, and the community. And this set the foundations for a model of prosperity that we have created called the Chandler Prosperity Model. And the heart of the model is based on these three elements, good government, vibrant economies, and strong communities. If we look at the model, we have a left engine and a right engine. On the right engine is something called trust. And we have found that without trust, Societies can't build sustainable prosperity and well-being. How is that so? Well, trust starts with government. We call it a governance waterfall. When there is trust in governance, it attracts investment into the economy. Governance can fund themselves. Businesses attract capital. And they have access to capital, but also the lower cost of capital comes with the higher trust. We see this empirically, the relationship between trust and prosperity in the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index. Of the 20 countries with the lowest corruption, the highest trust societies, they are all prosperous. Of the 50 countries with the lowest trust, the highest corruption, not one is prosperous. Trust is, is absolutely essential. In many ways, it might be trite or simplistic to say this, but the fastest way to be prosperous is to eliminate corruption. 
justice is a strategy. On the left engine, we have social mobility. Countries which have high social mobility have low income inequality. And especially in the Nordic countries, they have the highest levels of social mobility and the lowest levels of income inequality. So that is the Chandler Prosperity Model, and that underpins what we do at the Chandler Institute of Governance. That is our philosophy. Now, you might ask, why have we set up the Chandler Institute of Governance in Singapore? Well, very simply, we cannot influence what we do not model. And Singapore is a metaphor for good governance, and that's recognized around the world. Now, the thought is that that must be the result of leadership. And of course, Lee Kuan Yew's leadership of Singapore is legendary. But is governance really just about leadership, or is there something more to this? I would like to propose that leadership, that governance is too often conflated with leadership. And that good governance has more to do with the architecting and engineering of governance than it might have to do with leadership. And that leads us on to the idea that governance is a discipline in itself that in many ways is poorly understood. And I'd like to propose that Lee Kuan Yew, gifted as a politician, was supremely gifted as the architect and engineer of a nation. Now, if we look back in history, let us go back to people like the Babylonians under Hammurabi. The Hammurabi Code established basic human rights. Over a millennia later, Rome, Augustus Caesar, in the first century AD, established classic Roman law. Here we have another architect. And in the sixth century, Justinian, the Byzantine Roman emperor, built on that law and established the Justinian Code. And we see in the Anglo-Saxon development, British common law and American law, both established by nation builders who were architects and engineers. Indeed, the founding fathers of America looked back to Cyrus the Great. So I'd like to propose that governance is about the architecture and engineering of nations. And while politics and leadership is important, the architecture and engineering is even more so. So what do architects and engineers need to design their nations? They need tools. That's what the Chandler Institute of Governance is about. It's about providing tools, knowledge, frameworks, history to support leaders who wish to build strong cities, states, and nations. The Chandler Good Government Index is one such tool. It highlights the leaders and the laggards. There is much to learn from what the leaders do well. We all learn from each other. And it's important that governance as a discipline advances. Why is this? Well, we know that prosperity is contagious. Prosperity is a multiplier. Poor governance, on the other hand, leads to poverty. And poverty leads to violence. And violence also migrates. We all know that as our neighbor prospers, so do we. As our neighbor suffers, so do we. So we all have a stake in the governance competition. It's important that our neighboring countries prosper as our own country prospers. It's important that we expand the understanding and knowledge of governance as a discipline. Capital and talent migrate to good governance. That is the lesson of history. That is what the Chandler Institute of Governance wants to sow into. Good governance, governance for all. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. Now let's hear from Mr. Wu Wei Neng, 
the executive director of the Chandler Institute of Governance, who will tell us more about the index and, of course, share the country results. The mission of the Chandler Institute of Governance is to support strong and prosperous nations by enhancing the effectiveness of government. We do this through partnerships with national and regional governments in training, knowledge creation, and advisory work. Our work is practical and pragmatic, and we partner with experienced government practitioners and experts around the world. Never in living memory have governments around the world been more tested and the work of government more important. The global pandemic has shown us that governments are key to protecting jobs and livelihoods while safeguarding public health and security. Beyond this, governments must deal with complex challenges like climate change, ensuring social mobility, and countering discrimination and extremism. Over the years, our work with governments has convinced us that if governments can better measure, understand, and benchmark their capabilities and performance, they will be better placed to work with businesses, communities, citizens, and other nations to build a better, more sustainable world. I'd like to ask you to imagine how you, as an individual or a company, might make your decision on where to live, work, travel, invest, and build a stake in the future. We believe that talent, capital, investment, trust and prosperity will increasingly flow to peaceful, resilient, well-governed countries that offer a high quality of life. Good government is the foundation of long-term trust and prosperity. But what is good government and how can we measure it? Almost two years ago, the Chandler Institute of Governance set out to find a way to measure good government that was developed by government practitioners for government practitioners. Today, we're delighted to present to you the Chandler Good Government Index. The CGGI is the most comprehensive index of effective national government in the world. It measures the capabilities and effectiveness of governments in 104 countries that represent almost 90% of the world's population. You might be curious how we developed the index. We started by keeping an open mind and asking the experts, people who work in governments around the world, we conducted interviews with government leaders, civil servants, and other practitioners in a range of countries across five continents. We asked them about their lived experiences working in government and the qualities and capabilities that governments need most to succeed. And we were encouraged by the strong alignment in their responses. We know that countries are unique and have different political systems, histories, and cultures. But there is still a lot of common ground among government professionals on the question of which capabilities really matter. Our index is built around this core of practitioner wisdom. We then consulted with governance experts, professionals, and researchers to deepen our understanding and distill a range of perspectives. Part of this process involved the role of the distinguished members of the CGGI advisory panel and I want to express our gratitude to all of them. And this is the result. The index consists of 34 indicators, which are organized into seven broad pillars. The first six pillars focus on dimensions of government capabilities. These are leadership and foresight, robust laws and policies, strong institutions, financial stewardship, attractive marketplace, and global influence and reputation. The final pillar measures key outcomes of good government that create opportunities, helping people to rise and to fulfill their dreams and potential. Capabilities are crucial, and ultimately these capabilities need to translate into concrete government outcomes that matter to people and businesses. The indicators themselves are based on around 50 publicly available global data sources. 
These include sources based on perception surveys and expert assessments, as well as objective metrics of capabilities and outcomes. We offer the CGGI as a global public good. Our index indicator definitions, data sources, and methodology are fully transparent and available at no cost from our website. We welcome your thoughts and feedback. Here is a sample of some of the results of the 2021 Chandler Good Government Index. Finland takes the top spot overall. It earns this with a strong performance across the index, ranking first for the pillars of leadership and foresight, and strong institutions, and for helping people rise. It ranks fourth for the attractive marketplace pillar, and fifth for the robust laws and policies pillar. Switzerland comes in second. It also earns a high performance across the board with its strong financial and economic systems, inclusive policy making, and governance outcomes. Singapore is third and top in the Asia Pacific region. It earns first place in the attractive marketplace and financial stewardship pillars, third for leadership and foresight, and fourth for helping people rise. And here are the top 50 countries in this year's index. You might find the top 10 countries familiar. The countries coming in at the top of the Chandler Good Government Index are widely known for their quality of national governance. What is interesting is that these top 10 countries come from a range of geographies, population sizes, and administrative systems. Ultimately, a good government is simply one that has effective capabilities and delivers desired outcomes. We can also see that European nations feature prominently in the top 20. This is a testament to the long history of institution building, codification of legal and administrative systems, and professional technocratic governance in these countries. Overall, we see a correlation between income status and government performance. Good governance is a necessary foundation for prosperity, while higher income countries have more resources to build strong systems, recruit and retain talented civil servants, and provide good public services. This is a virtuous cycle that supports national progress. But the CGGI also shows that good government is not limited to wealthy Western nations. Within the top 50, there are 12 middle-income countries and a range of geographies. Rwanda and India, the highest performing low-income and lower middle-income countries respectively, outperform some higher income countries. Digging more deeply into the index results, we were fascinated to find interesting stories of countries performing relatively well in specific pillars, regardless of their index rank and income level. South Korea ranks 11th for financial stewardship, Chile takes 13th spot for leadership and foresight, while Malaysia makes it into the top 20 for attractive marketplace. Botswana, formerly one of the world's poorest countries, is joint leader alongside countries like Denmark, Finland and Switzerland in keeping government debt levels sustainable. In the same way, Costa Rica scores 40th overall, but behind the pillar scores, it achieves several impressive indicator rankings, such as joint second place in strategic prioritization, 17th for innovation, joint first in regulatory governance, and joint 11th in attracting investments. We are keen to explore the performance of specific groups of countries. For instance, several Nordic countries have performed well. Some attribute this to culture and history, others to the Nordic social welfare model, or effective national institutions that reinforce public trust in government. Meanwhile, Singapore's good performance shows that good governance is a possibility for all nations, regardless of size, natural resources, and land. Recent crises such as COVID-19 have highlighted the role and importance of national governance. New Zealand, the UAE, and South Korea, which rank 5th, 8th, and 21st respectively in leadership and foresight, have implemented successful strategies in managing the pandemic. Of the 34 indicators we looked at, anti-corruption 
is the single indicator that has the strongest correlation with the overall capabilities and performance of governments. Low levels of corruption are also essential for promoting public and marketplace trust. If you're wondering whether better government capabilities translate into better outcomes, the answer is absolutely yes. Here we can see a strong correlation between the two. Investing in good government capabilities is vital to securing positive outcomes for people and businesses. The same seven countries that top the overall index also perform the best in outcomes. This reveals an urgent gap. Trillions of dollars in donor funding have been disbursed worldwide, but relatively little has focused on developing capabilities in government. Capabilities matter, such as planning, data analysis, budgeting, corruption control, investment promotion, and operational management. We urge development partners and institutions to design and implement programs that do not bypass or replace the role of governments, but instead intentionally empower and strengthen governments as a critical part of a long-term solution. Finally, here are some ways you can use the index and its findings. The CGGI is designed to be a practical tool. It offers a new way for governments to benchmark and understand their capabilities and performance, examine case studies of impactful policy and effective delivery, and have honest conversations about opportunities for progress. Our index website has several interactive features designed to help governments, researchers, and other users navigate the data. First, you can filter results by pillar and by the geography, income level, and GDP of countries to construct your own peer group analysis and benchmarks. Next, using the country comparison tool, you can compare the results of up to three countries across the seven index pillars. Finally, we understand that from time to time, one or more indicators we measure might be particularly important to a specific country. Our website allows users to increase or decrease the weights of selected indicators to meet these needs. The index website has now gone live, and I encourage you to explore the results for yourself. You can explore all 104 countries featured in the index with detailed scores for all 34 indicators. Our website also features country profiles and stories about governance, including contributions by government practitioners. Thank you for your attention. I hope you are eager to find out more about the Chandler Good Government Index and to explore and use its findings. Please get in touch with us if you would like to discuss the index and its use. Thank you, Wei Neng. With that, we are happy to announce that the Index website is now live. The CGGI report and executive summary is also now available for viewing or downloading. You can find the links to all of these on the resources page of this launch site. Do refresh the page to access the links. I promised earlier that we will also be inviting you to key in your responses to two questions through the poll tab. So here's the first question. Do you think that high levels of public trust are important to enable governments to do their work better. If you have your video open in full screen, please minimize your video first so that you can access the poll tab to submit your response. This poll will be open for five minutes and we will share the results after the panel discussion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to be joined by a distinguished panel of governance practitioners and experts for our discussion today. Let's welcome Dr. Rajiv Lal, Chairman of the Advisory Panel at the IDFC Institute in India. Welcome, Dr. Rajiv. I'd also like to welcome Musi Maimani, former leader of the Democratic Alliance in South Africa and founder of the One South Africa Movement. Rebecca Smith, Director of the New Zealand Story Group. Professor Kent Weaver, Professor of Public Policy and Government at Georgetown University. 
and welcoming back Wu Wei Neng, Executive Director of the Chandler Institute of Governance. Welcome back, Wei Neng. All right, welcome everybody. It's great to have you on this panel with me today. Uh, let's start with you first, Wei Neng. We're all very excited about the launch of the CGGI. Uh, tell us, what do you hope will happen from here on in terms of you know, how do you want the index to be used and what do you want others to do with it? We've designed the index to be a practical tool for governments and we hope that the index can support governments in the important work that they do. So the first thing, of course, we hope is that governments, governance practitioners, experts, academics will take a hard look at the results dive into the data, explore the findings, and there are some tools on the website, as I mentioned just a minute ago, that can help users to do that. And of course, more broadly, we hope to contribute to the discussion of what good government is. We've put forward one view and one perspective. We're looking forward to engaging and speaking and discussing with experts around the world so that we can learn more as well. And I think lastly, we're looking forward to working with governments as you know, the Chandler Institute of Governance also works closely with government leaders and officers around the world. So we're looking forward to using the index and also to working with these governments in research and training and programs and advisory work. And we're so excited that the website and its resources and links are all live right now, isn't it, uh, Wei Neng? Now, coming back to my wonderful guest today, the focus of our discussion really is about building capable and trusted governance. Each of you is an experienced governance practitioner. So what is the one or two most important things that you think governments need to do in order to progress, uh, continue to improve, as well as become more trusted by people, businesses, and the international community? I would like to invite each of you to respond to this. So let's start with you first, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you. Um, so the key word you used um, is trust. Um, I think building trust um, with various stakeholders um, is the key. And uh, so working backwards, what is going to be most effective in building trust between government and stakeholders? I um, would like to summarize it in two points. Uh, it's very complex, but if I had to pick two, these would be the two. The first is fairness. Um, and the second, is uh, uh, competence and reliability, competence stroke reliability. So fairness um, uh, is essential um, to building trust with, with stakeholders. Um, if you look at the average citizen in India, for example, um, when he or she is looking um, to anybody to develop a relationship of trust, they must be assured that in that relationship, they have been treated with dignity and with a perceived sense of fairness. So fairness can be delivered in many, many different ways. Um, but if you were to break it down, um, it would be in terms of delivery of essential services that I as an individual or as a business need um, to get on with my life. So that could be the usual, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's uh, public services, um, all of that. Um, it would be health, it would be education, that whole list. Second, when it comes to competence and reliability, I must have the confidence to trust you as government that when I need you most, you are there to deliver for me, right? Um, so I, I put these two um, even ahead of transparency. Transparency is much talked about, but these two would be my top two picks. So fairness and com competency stroke reliability Correct. for you. Thank you for setting the scene for us, Dr. Rajiv. Musi, can I invite you to weigh in on this too? What do you think are the two most important things that governments need to do now to become more trusted? Thank you very much. And for me, the two most central tenets are obviously the idea of participatory democracy at one level, and secondly, the direct accountability of that democracy. And the point simply is, I live in a continent of Africa. We've seen how democracy has been captured by a few to become an elite project. And once it's been captured by those few individuals, invariably citizens take a secondary role, whether that's about delivery, whether, whether that's about engagement, and then it begins to truly engage in populist trends 
where citizens' voice is secondary to big men and big politics who override institutions. So what we've got to fix is if we're going to address the first question of governance, it's about making sure citizens can participate into that, not superficially, but being able to give them the tools to participate and contribute in the aspirations of their nation, not only by voting every so often, but ultimately in the process of governance that there's a feedback loop of continuous dialogue between public institutions and citizens themselves. And then the second dynamic is this question of direct democracy, which ultimately asks the question globally, we're living in a world where a few big political players are able to polarize society in the rise of populism. How do we get back to ensuring that actually democracy is localized and that citizens feel that their public representatives are people they can touch, feel, engage with, so that that conversation is enhanced. If we don't achieve that, then ultimately you go back to the first where politics becomes an elite spot that is distant from citizens. Thank you, Musi. So it's about giving the people the ability to participate. I, I like that phrase that you use, that feedback loop. loop. So hold that thought because I have another question for you, but I'll come back to that later. Thanks, Musi. Uh, Rebecca, could I hear your views on this question too? Yes, thank you. Uh, look, for New Zealand, it's uh, we're in a slightly different position in that we have a, a very high degree of transparency and institutional trust and confidence, um, but we also have uh, relatively little variation between political parties. So we're fairly centrist in, in most instances. Probably the biggest challenge for a small advanced nation such as ours is more complacency. Uh, and so being able to continue to drive forward um, for good governance and really take note of indices like this, for example, uh, and really look deep inside to continue to see what we can do better. Uh, that's actually the bigger challenge for, for a country like ours. So always striving to do better and not letting complacency take over. Thanks, Rebecca. Professor Kent? Yeah, so I would highlight two things. Uh, the first has already been mentioned, but I'll expand on it a little bit. Uh, and that's just delivery of public services, regular delivery of public services in ways that are seen as being uh, effective and responsive to people's needs. So that's you know, water, electricity, schools. Uh, it's also being able to deliver on big capital projects and you know, things like building a subway system, building a new sewer system uh, in ways that are seen as being responsive to people's uh, needs. That makes them more willing to pay their taxes and less likely to engage in workarounds that feed the corruption system. So paying bribes, for example, to get a business license. And, and so the second factor, in addition to delivery of public services, is just sort of everyday anti-corruption uh, issues that, uh, you know, if you have to pay a bribe to a traffic uh, cop, if you have to pay a bribe at several stages in the process to get a business license. Uh, so things like uh, reducing the number of steps that you need to uh, register a business uh, and making sure that uh, the health and safety inspectors are not taking bribes to uh, avoid uh, fines for violation. Those are the things I would stress. Well, thank you, Kent, uh, and to my guest for giving us an overview of what you think are the two most important things um, that really make up the tenets of uh, good governance. I wanna to turn to you now, Rebecca, uh, and your important work in sharing New Zealand's story. So New Zealand scores highly on the 2021 CGGI. Why do you think people around the world should sit up and pay attention to what New Zealand's government is doing? And I see a big smile on your face there, Rebecca, tell us. Well, I, th I think for, for the last uh, few years, we've we've tackled a few crises. And what that has shown the world is that there is a slightly different way of tackling these and getting through them in a way that puts people first. And so I think the opportunity for nations such as ours is to, um, is to stay true to our values and to demonstrate that there is a different way of um, resolving conflict and dealing with crises. Uh, and leading uh, you know, our team of 5 million through to a successful outcome. 
Um, COVID has certainly shone a light on this. Uh, we've got also got an incredible um, spokesperson in our leader, very empathetic and decisive leader. Uh, and again, I think it just gives the world an opportunity to see that there's a slightly different way and it may or may not fit different countries, um, but it's certainly something that I feel is, um, is valued in this very complex um, political environment that we live in. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, I want to bring you back into the conversation. You have been um, a business leader. You hold many hats, right? Business leader, international economist, and a scholar. You've also advised uh, various governments, and including the government of India, on many important issues. Uh, how do you think the private sector and governments can continue to work together in principled and effective ways? So the private sector, <clears throat> is um is an interesting animal when you look at it from this lens okay um and when you say the private sector i take i interpret that mm. as gen more broadly speaking the market um, and the market is an amoral entity the market does not make any um, value judgments on justice um, on equality, on um, society. Um, and therefore, uh, what uh, market agents need um, is in a political sense very different from what um, uh, society more broadly needs. Um, so given that this is the nature of the market, I think what the market participants are looking for from governments mm -hmm most of all, is um, predictability, uh, a set of rules that are quite clear to them, that are stable, reliable, and judiciable. So dispute resolution um, for conflict in the case of differences of opinion, um, but you give them rules and you make them predictable and they will generally abide or make compromises of many other sorts, and they will get on with their business. So that's my somewhat, um, shall we call it, apolitical view of the compact between private sector, market participants, and government. So having that predictability, the stable set of rules as, yes. a, as, as a guidance, right, for them to follow. But the rules are very important, and that's you know, what is loosely called the rule of law. The rule of law has many other connotations, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's, it's a sense, it's a, it's a set of rules mm -hmm. that defines um, the framework within which they are expected to behave. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Um, coming back uh, to have, uh, with a more general view of things now, general lens, one of the major purposes of the CGGI really is for it to serve as a platform, right, to facilitate and encourage peer learning between countries. While we well, we recognize that each country has its own unique needs. How can governments continue to learn from one another? It's just quite a tall order to ask. Um, Professor Kent, would you like to weigh in on this question? Yeah, well, I think that uh, regional forums uh, organized by uh, the UN, by uh, international development banks and other kinds of organizations, uh, and by uh, universities and other sorts of organizations uh, to uh, have this information be made more localized. So uh, Southeast Asia, for example, those countries do look to each other in terms of their, exper uh, their experiences. And they do want to say, you know, we do better on the doing business index in Malaysia than Indonesia, for example. Uh, and so I think that uh, they are already looking at each other. And so what needs to be done is to uh, show particular practical things that countries have done that are replicable, maybe not in exact terms, but uh, for example, that uh, development of anti-corruption commissions, which are independent. Uh, can be a very useful tool. They have to be tailored to individual countries and to their experiences. Uh, but uh, I think countries are eager to learn from one another. But again, primarily within their own region because they see these countries 
as peers and also as competitors. So the approach has to be tailored and as you've said, practical, but also replicable, not wholesale, but more targeted approach. Thanks, Professor Kent. Uh, Musi, would you like to weigh in on this question too? How do you think countries or governments can continue to learn from each other? I, I, I do think certainly the geopolitical structures that exist uh, need to be strengthened because I find that they become these symbolic bodies. Uh, in the continent of Africa, you look at the African Union and you often find that much of the input that gets put back is not of much use to governments. It's not looking at future states of government and the interrelationships between that. So that's the first. The second is on a much more practical terms. I think that you've got to build the capacity of the bureaucracy so that the learnings can be applicable. So, and I do think universities have a crucial role here. How many students are exchanging knowledge across different continents becomes uh, a very vital question and the learnings that go with it. And then lastly, I think the accountability that states face, you know, you can, you, you can, you can, without trying to interfere in the sovereignty of any particular country, but how do you ensure that once you've have an agreed upon learnings, there's a sense upon which it's accountable. Otherwise it stops the learning from being cultivated into the bureaucracy over a long period of time. So you often will find that to my earlier point, if you get leadership that is stronger than the institutions, they can literally progressively weaken the institutions. So any learning doesn't feature through and foreign governments and or governments that are interconnected aren't always able to hold those to account. But in the real world, we've got to ensure that that accountability is affected. So I would really hone in on those three aspects to to ensure that learnings are not only as, as circulated amongst countries, but are also given effect in an accountable manner. Thank you, Musi, for highlighting the importance of accountability in this context. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, I see you nodding too, as uh, Professor Kent and Musi are talking. What are your thoughts on this question? So I think that um, there's a lot more work to be done in terms of creating platforms for sharing um, and exchanging experiences um, on building state capability. Um, <clears throat> and you have to find a forum that uh, is able to detach itself or separate itself from ideology um, and geopolitics. Mm -hmm. um, how you do that is, is a challenge, but for example, um, you take any grouping. Um, I don't know if the G20 is a good example, but it is good example as any. Uh, the, G, the G20 has several working groups. Yeah. Um, uh, but they could, if they if they were imaginative, create a working group. They have a working group on infrastructure, for example, right? But they could create a working group on state capacity building, um, and allow more technical um, level exchanges between bureaucracies, shared experience of dealing with certain types of problems. I'll give you an example, land records and land titles. Mm -hmm. How do you make them more robust? How do you uh, fix that? It, it, you know, land titling is a root problem um, in so many countries. A working group that is more technical in nature on an appropriate platform is an idea that might push the needle a little bit on this conversation. So it kind of ties in with uh, a little bit with what uh, Professor Kent said, right? Tailored approach, finding that uh, forming a specific group with the technical expertise that's right. needed to pinpoint the, the problem. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, Rebecca, as we talked about briefly earlier, why governments uh, or people around the world should sit up and uh, pay attention to New Zealand's government, what do you think uh, other countries can learn from uh, New Zealand's uh, values-based response to, you know, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic and more? Uh, look, for our experience uh, has been one where we've put values at the very heart of everything that we do. And it's, it's certainly taken some time to ensure that we've embedded that. Um, but what it does do is it means that when there are crises, that it's, it's not a case of um, reaching for the crisis management book, uh, you know, what actions you need to take and, and what you need to say. 
because we're all on the same page already. So what we've found is that um, having a very strong values-based approach to uh, the work that we do across the public and private sector means that we're automatically uh, speaking uh, towards uh, you know, similar goals and similar objectives, and we're able to align far more quickly as a result of that. Um, now that does take work and it does take, um, as has already been said, you know, strong institutions, transparency, confidence, trust in the people that we're dealing with. So we are fortunate in that we're dealing with um, a good baseline already. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say that the, the values-based approach has been uh, you know, transformative for us as we deal with um, this very changeable and challenging environment. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I like that you mentioned that it's really not about just having a crisis management uh, handbook, right? Just, okay, throwing that out of the window. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Musi, coming back to you, you have been a veteran political leader and legislator, and you're now the chief activist behind the One South Africa movement. And we've got many success stories from that initiative. How can ground up social movements for change uh, work constructively with governments to achieve positive impact. Uh, this kind of ties back in with uh, this first pointer that you mentioned earlier on about having that feedback loop. I'd love for you to elaborate a lot more on that. I mean, democracy isn't just giving a mandate to someone. In many ways, it's also finding ways to uh, have oversight over that, uh, that, uh, that mandate. And so key actors and players, especially from the grassroots up, the first thing is, Policymakers tend to ignore the fact that actually people who are living through experiences that are in need of water, housing, energy, are actually often central and experts at what needs they have as a community. Because what you cannot afford to be doing is drafting policy that is elite driven, missing out on what the poor often are in desperate need of. So that conversation is vital. Secondly, in terms of, so that deals with the primary question of delivery. But the second is, is about identifying leaders that come from those communities that work in that feedback mechanism I was describing earlier. That says that mm. public representation nowadays ought to be exactly that. You ought to be representing the very citizens that come from there, whether that's at local government or whether that's at national government, but the relationship is vital. And then ultimately, being able to across, whether it's both public and private sector institutions, upholding the dialogue so that the abuses of power don't or, or are curbed, but also the relationships are maintained so that delivery is effective, so that ultimately, over a long period of time, citizens can truly draft societies that they want. And so social movements play a vital role as a partner to delivery and as a partner to accountability. You set them out, you create an elite sport out of governance. Thank you, Musi. Really, it's about upholding the importance of dialogue for uh, these social movements to really achieve that positive impact that it's set out to do. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kent, I, I want to come back to you now too. You've worked uh, with many governments in the field, you've trained many government leaders, and you're also a full-time professor. Now, there has been um, quite a bit of thoughtful discussion on how uh, higher education and research institutions uh, can still stay relevant and useful. And I think Musi also pointed that out uh, a little bit earlier on the usefulness and importance of higher education. So in this context, how do you think um, academic expertise and research can best support the building of capable and trusted governments on the ground? Professor Kent? Sure. So I think there are several things they can do. Uh, first is uh, that they can help governments to evaluate programs and not just sort of informal evaluation. Gee, I think this works, but really quite rigorous evaluations of the effectiveness of government programs. Uh, both to show what works and also to show what doesn't work. And showing what doesn't work is really important in terms of not wasting resources. Uh, and it then leads you to say, well, why does this program, which we had every reason to believe would work, didn't work at least as well as we had hoped that, that it, it would work. And so let's get back into the mechanism of that program and figure out what we can change so that we can make uh, make it work more effectively. And that has not only to do with the design of the program, but the way it's implemented. Maybe it was a really great program, but you know, on the uh, on the ground implementation was the problem. And if that's the problem, 
I think that academic researchers can help officials uh, do that, not necessarily doing the, the evaluation themselves, but helping governments to figure out how to do more effective evaluations. I am a big believer in case method teaching, where you give people experience with rich real life experiences of what country X has done and country Y's experience may not be, and, and background may not be exactly the same, but there's still usually a lot that they can learn. And how do I confront this particular time kind of challenge and how should I respond? Thanks, Professor Kent. Now that I uh, still have you on a hot seat, I'd just like to get your thoughts very quickly on this uh, question, because it's been 20 years since you co-authored and edited Guidance to Good Governance. So what do you think has or hasn't changed in terms of the fundamentals of good governance in the last two decades? Um, well, I think that uh, many of the things that we've talked about here, the things that are highlighted in the good government uh, index are are still critical. It's you know you need leadership that's committed to uh, 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 transformative and transparent government. Uh, you need a system of policy advice. That's what that book was uh, about. Largely was how do you provide policy advice uh, to government? So uh, that's essential. Uh, and then you need uh, mechanisms uh, to translate that advice into actual transformation in terms of overall policies and implementation. But I think we've learned a lot about what works and, and what doesn't work in, in particular policies, and that can definitely be helpful in the process. Thank you, Professor Kent. Actual transformation, that's what we really want to see. Uh, Rajiv, I want to direct this uh, next question to you. You've said before that good economic governance depends on political governance and that the concept of economic and political governance cannot be disassociated from each other. Do you think that statement is more relevant than ever now um, as business leaders seem to be more trusted by the public than government leaders in various countries? Um. Well, actually, um, uh, yeah, the, the economic governance and political governance um, go hand in hand, um, uh, I think remains very much true. Um, uh, what is interesting, and I talk here from um, an Indian perspective, is that um, there is, a, seems to be a generalized breakdown of trust um, uh, between the ordinary citizen and government, but also business. So it's not as if business leaders are more trusted um, than government leaders. Um, they are uniformly distrusted, particularly big business, right? Um, so w over the last 20, 30 years that uh, India has moved um, towards becoming a market economy, the perception has grown and the sense has grown amongst the general population um, that big business is not necessarily to be trusted. Uh, and media plays a very important role in, 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 in some senses, exaggerating um, this, uh, this, this breakdown, breakdown in trust. So uh, it, we have a lot of work to do actually, um, both business as well as government in rebuilding that trust. And it seems to me that uh, business cannot just point to poor government. Business themselves have a lot to do, a lot of work to do in terms of improving their own ethical standards. And I would say, especially in the 21st century and especially what we've seen after the pandemic, in the wake of the pandemic, business responsibility to wider society needs to be internalized by business leaders. So um, the leadership in the business community has to rise to the challenge just as much as leadership in government. Well, you heard it here first from Dr. Rajiv. Leadership in the business community must rise up just as much as leadership in governments. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, coming back to you now as well, uh, Rebecca, you know, you, I think there's much that can be leveraged on uh, the 
empathy, the leadership uh, and the trust that New Zealand is recognized for. In, in that aspect then, what other role can New Zealand's government play in the ways forward for solving uh, problems? Uh, look, I, I think we've we've always um, been eager to play the role of facilitator in uh, global conversations, and in part because we're a relatively sort of neutral and um, and fair and equitable uh, country by nature. Um, and I think it's there's a role for uh, uh, you know countries like New Zealand and other smaller um, nations to play in facilitating great dialogue. I think we have um, a lot to bring to the table uh, in terms of, as, as Mamusi said, you know, shifting some of that emphasis and balance of power um, from some of the global players and being able to ensure that voices of many are heard. Um, we've certainly played our role there in, in places like the UN Security Council, um, World Trade Organization and others. So I, I, do, I, I, I do feel that there is more opportunity for um, smaller countries that have got um, some some strong um, economic and political um, positions to play a greater role in facilitation and coordination across other nations. Thank you, Rebecca. Facilitation of dialogue, that is so important. And Musi, I want to quickly uh, pick your brains about this question before I conclude as well. You've had a lot of experience as a parliamentarian. Um, how do you think uh, national parliaments and legislators can stay relevant and at the same time still reflect the concerns and needs of its people in an increasingly complex world, Musi? Yeah, and I, and I think that Again, without trying to overemphasize this uh, this discussion about uh, community and community engagement and that dialogue, but playing a facilitatory role across various actors and players, not in a patronizing sort of way, but in a way that says, where are effective business leadership happening in, in sectors? Where is civic society being engaged? How do grassroots mobilization happen? Because speaking from a South African perspective, participatory democracy has really felt its own weakness as more and more polit politicians are no longer engaged with communities. And I think if parliament has to remain relevant, citizens need to know that the laws that are being passed in those parliaments reflect their interests and their ambitions. And that actually consultation has been had about what type of society we truly are wanting to build. Because at this point in time, the debates in parliament can quickly become about issues that can at times be seen to be distant from citizens. And therefore it increases that, that frustration as unemployment rises, poverty rises, inequality of those issues. And I just do think effective parliamentary work needs to be restored back to how do we locate it in constituencies. That's why it becomes important even for South Africa to reform its own legislation about where people participate and where constituencies are based because it's becoming more and more distant from the citizens as it were. And then lastly, the institutions outside not only of parliament, but the institutions that are count to parliament need to know that they derive their mandate from the very citizens who elect the people. Thank you so much, uh, Musi. Those were some really well said points. Um, you know, um, Professor Kant, Rebecca Musi, Dr. Rajiv Wainang, this has been a really fascinating discussion. And I would like to conclude by coming back to the focus of our event today, building capable and trusted governments. So if I could just have each one of you choose one capability out of the Chandler Good Government Index, and explain to me why you personally feel that one capability out of the 34 indicators, why that one capability you feel is um, very, very important for governments to prioritize in development. Okay, so we're gonna go. I wanna invite each of you to respond to this. Let's start with you first, Dr. Reggie. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, I would put it like this. Um, good governance, um, is the artful balance between delivering prosperity, social justice, and agency to citizens. Um, to deliver this requires a functioning, capable state. And when I say state, I'm referring to the internal plumbing of it. 
So with that perspective in mind, I would have to pick the bureaucracy. I would have to say that if we focus, if we don't have a decent functioning bureaucracy, no government, however well-meaning, will be able to deliver good governance. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Rebecca, coming to you now, that one capability in the CGGI that you would pick. Uh, I am going to pick a nation brand, being a nation brand practitioner myself, because I do believe that um, for us, uh, the transformation in this area has been not just um, good governance for our own sake, but how do we become good for the world? How can we do things that are not just good for our own citizens, for our own people, for our own region, for our own community, but how can we focus on things that are also going to benefit others around the world? And I'd say that if, if more countries um, were able to, to, to get into that place, um, we'd be a much happier world. So for you, it'd be the pillar of a global influence and reputation. Absolutely, because I do, it's not, you know, reputation and influence for influence sake necessarily. It's to influence a better outcome for all. And that's certainly a focus that we have. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Lucy, your one key capability. I know it's a tough choice. <laughs> <laughs> in a continent that has produced people like Nelson Mandela, etc., you realize that leadership matters, but where, where there are weak institutions, that leadership can be good and can equally be dangerous. So if I was to pick one, mm -hmm. I'd pick strong institutions because those institutions give you predictability. They give you a sense of data management and a legal certainty for people to be able to invest, etc., and what they then do is they make sure leadership operates within that. We've seen too many African states get, get governed by, by bad leaders who happen to find bad institutions or weak institutions. And the net consequence of that is that the nation is destroyed. So I would, for the continent of Africa and certainly globally, focus on the, on the capability or the pillar focused on institutional governance and saying, how do we strengthen our institutions so that leadership as a variable is an actor, but not the sole factor that determines the trajectory of a nation. Absolutely. Thank you, Musi. Professor Kent. So I would focus on the, uh, the pillar of leadership, leadership and foresight. And within that, I would focus on anti-corruption. Uh, and I think uh, anti-corruption is a very diverse set of activities. Uh, you know, everything from reducing petty corruption to to bribery and grand corruption, nepotism, collusion. Uh, it's a, uh, a very rich area. And I think that going back to where we started with building trust in government, uh, if you have in the everyday level and at the grand level, uh, the experience is government is corrupt. Why should I give them my taxes? Why should I play by the rules uh, that you, you can't get much done as long as corruption is seen as being pervasive. Thank you, Professor Kent. Weining, is it fair to ask you to choose that one key capability as well? Well, we think uh, all 34 capabilities are obviously important to governments, mm -hmm. but close to my heart as a yep. former civil servant in the government, uh, I would pick implementation. And I think um, as well as uh, several other panelists have alluded to this as well, um, in our work with governments, we see that actually government leaders have a lot of good ideas. Very often, there are good strategies, good plans, good ideas. I think as some others have said, the challenge comes in translating these plans and strategies into action on the ground, in implementing policies. And uh, often people confuse action planning with implementation. Action planning is not implementation. Uh, doing things on the ground, the ability to execute, the ability to break down complex plans into smaller micro tasks and ensure they're done well. I think that separates uh, effective governments who are able to translate these good plans and good strategies into outcomes people care about. And I think that to me is very important. Thank you, Wayne. Action planning is not the same as implementation, something worth pointing out again. Thank you so much, Wayne, Dr. Rajiv, Musi, Rebecca, Professor Kent. Ladies and gentlemen, my panelists have clearly highlighted why good government matters to all of us, especially when dealing with global challenges such as financial crises or the COVID-19 pandemic or climate change. Good governance is the deciding factor as to whether a nation succeeds or not. And my distinguished panel of guests today have clearly highlighted 
highlighted that when we have better governance capabilities, that translates to better outcomes for all. And as they have highlighted too, the key capability that they think each government should prioritize in developing for Rebecca, it's the global influence and reputation. For Dr. Rajiv, it's about tackling bureaucracy. For Musi, it's about having strong institutions. For Professor Kent, it's about ending corruption. And for Weining, it's all about that implementation. So I thank you for sharing your wonderful insights today. I've learned a lot from each of you, and I'm sure our audience too have gleaned many key takeaways from this very enlightening conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for participating in our first poll earlier. Now let's have a look at the results. And now, here's the second question. Do you think that only wealthy countries will have the resources to build effective government institutions? The poll is now open and we will share the results shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, our panelists today have shown us that governments need to have a way to measure good government. They need a tool that is practical, relevant and focused on capabilities to help them understand and benchmark their capabilities and performance and to identify opportunities for progress. On a broader level, the results of the CGGI are important evidence that investing in strong government capabilities is vital to securing positive outcomes for people and businesses. We invite you to further explore the data and results on the CGGI website. If you would like to read an in-depth analysis of the index methodology and results, you will find the CGGI report useful. You can find these items on the resources page on this launch site if you've not had the chance to take a look. Please do also share your thoughts on what good government means to you. Leave us a note on the good government page on this launch site. We would love to hear from you. Thank you everyone for participating in our second poll. You will now be able to view the results on the poll tab. And once again, we want to thank you for joining us for the inaugural launch of the Chandler Good Government Index. The CIG team is looking forward to working with you to support and build more effective and trusted governance around the world. Till next time, stay safe and goodbye.